Chapter 4 of Atlantic Classics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Wayne Anderson, Chelsea, Quebec. Every Man's Natural Desire to Be Somebody Else by Samuel McCord Crothers. Part 1. Several years ago, a young man came to my study with a manuscript, which he wished me to criticize. It's only a little bit of my work, he said modestly, and it will not take you long to look it over. In fact, it is only the first chapter in which I explain the universe. I suppose that we have all had moments of sudden illumination when it occurred to us that we had explained the universe and it was so easy for us that we wondered why we had not done it before. Some thought drifted into our mind and filled us with vague forebodings of omniscience. It was not an ordinary thought that explained only a fragment of existence. It explained everything. It proved one thing, and it proved the opposite just as well. It explained why things are as they are, and if it should turn out that they are not that way at all, it would prove that fact also. In the light of our great thought, chaos seemed rational. Such thoughts usually occur about four o'clock in the morning. Having explained the universe, we relapse into satisfied slumber. When a few hours later we rise, we wonder what the explanation was. Now and then, however, one of these highly explanatory ideas remains to comfort us in our waking hours. Such a thought is that which I here throw out and which has doubtless at some early hour occurred to most of my readers, it is that every man has a natural desire to be somebody else. This does not explain the universe, but it explains that perplexing part of it which we call human nature. It explains why so many intelligent people who deal skillfully with matters of fact make such a mess of it when they deal with their fellow creatures. It explains why we get on as well as we do with strangers and why we do not get on better with our friends. It explains why people are so often offended when we say nice things about them and why it is that when we say harsh things about them, they take it as a compliment. It explains why people marry their opposites and why they live happily ever afterwards. It also explains why some people don't. It explains the meaning of tact and its opposite. The tactless person treats a person according to a scientific method, as if he were a thing. Now, in dealing with a thing, you must first find out what it is, and then act accordingly. But with a person, you must find out what he is, and then carefully conceal from him the fact that you have made the discovery. The tactless person can never be made to understand this. He prides himself on taking people as they are, without being aware that that is not the way they want to be taken. He has a keen eye for the obvious and calls attention to it. Age, sex, color, nationality, previous condition of servitude, and all the facts that are interesting to the census taker are apparent to him and are made the basis of his conversation. When he meets one who is older than he, he is conscious of the fact and emphasizes by every polite attention the disparity in years. He has an idea that at a certain period in life the highest tribute of respect is to be urged to rise out of one chair and take another that is presumably more comfortable. It does not occur to him that there may remain any tastes that are not sedentary. On the other hand, he sees a callow youth and addresses himself to the obvious callowness and thereby makes himself thoroughly disliked. For strange to say, the youth prefers to be addressed as a person of precocious maturity. The literalist, observing that most people talk shop, takes it for granted that they like to talk shop. This is a mistake. They do it because it is the easiest thing to do, but they resent having attention called to their limitations. A man's profession does not necessarily coincide with his natural aptitude or with his predominant desire. When you meet a member of the Supreme Court, you may assume that he is gifted with a judicial mind, but it does not follow that that is the only quality of mind he has, nor that when out of court he gives you a piece of his mind 
it will be a piece of his judicial mind that he gives. My acquaintance with royalty is limited to photographs of royal groups which exhibit a high degree of domesticity. It would seem that the business of royalty, when pursued as a steady job, becomes tiresome, and that when they have their pictures taken, they endeavor to look as much like ordinary folks as possible, and they usually succeed. The member of one profession is always flattered by being taken for a skilled practitioner of another. Try it on your minister. Instead of saying, that was an excellent sermon of yours this morning, say, as I listened to your cogent argument, I thought, what a successful lawyer you would have made. Then he will say, I did think of taking to the law. If you had belonged to the court of Frederick the Great, you would have proved a poor courtier indeed if you had praised his majesty's campaigns. Frederick knew he was a Prussian general, but he wanted to be a French literary man. If you wished to gain his favor, you should have told him that, in your opinion, he excelled Voltaire. We do not like to have too much attention drawn to our present circumstances. They may be well enough in their way, but we can think of something which would be more fitting for us. We have either seen better days, or we expect them. Suppose you had visited Napoleon in Elba, and had sought to ingratiate yourself with him. Sire, you would have said, this is a beautiful little empire of yours, so snug and cozy and quiet. It is just such a domain as is suited to a man in your condition. The climate is excellent. Everything is peaceful. It must be delightful to rule where everything is arranged for you and the details are taken care of by others. As I came to your dominion, I saw a line of British frigates guarding your shores. The evidences of such thoughtfulness are everywhere. Your praise of his present condition would not have endeared you to Napoleon. You were addressing him as the Emperor of Elba. In his own eyes, he was Emperor, though in Elba. It is such a misapprehension which irritates any mature human being when his environment is taken as the measure of his personality. The man with a literal mind moves in a perpetual comedy of errors. It is not a question of two dramanos, there are half a dozen dominoes under one hat. How casually introductions are made, as if it were the easiest thing in the world to make two human beings acquainted. Your friend says, I want you to know Mr. Stifflekin, and you say that you are happy to know him. But does either of you know the enigma that goes under the name of Stifflekin? You may know what he looks like and where he resides and what he does for a living, but that is all in the present tense. To really know him, you must not only know what he is, but what he used to be, what he used to think he was, what he used to think he ought to be and might be if he worked hard enough. You must know what he might have been if certain things had happened otherwise, and you must know what might have happened otherwise if he had been otherwise. All these complexities are part of his own dim apprehension of himself. They are what make him so much more interesting to himself than he is to anyone else. It is this consciousness of the inadequacy of our knowledge which makes us so embarrassed when we offer any service to another. Will he take it in the spirit in which it is given? This was an awkward moment when Stanley, after all his hardships in search for Dr. Livingston, at last found the doctor by a lake in Central Africa. Stanley held out his hand and said stiffly, Dr. Livingston, I presume? Stanley had heroically plunged through the equatorial forests to find Livingston and bring him back to civilization. But Livingston was not particularly anxious to be found and had a decided objection to being brought back to civilization. What he wanted was a new adventure. Stanley did not find the real Livingston till he discovered that the old man was as young at heart as himself. The two men became acquainted only when they began to plan a new expedition to find the source of the Nile. Part 2 The natural desire of every man to be somebody else explains many of the minor irritations of life. It prevents that perfect organization of society in which everyone should know his place and keep it. The desire to be somebody else leads us to practice on work that does not strictly belong to us, 
We all have aptitudes and talents that overflow the narrow bounds of our trade or profession. Every man feels that he is bigger than his job, and he is all the time doing what theologians call works of supererogation. The serious-minded housemaid is not content to do what she is told to do. She has an unexpended balance of energy. She wants to be a general household reformer, so she goes to the desk of the titular master of the house and gives it a thorough reformation. She arranges the papers according to her idea of neatness. When the poor gentleman returns and finds his familiar chaos transformed into a hateful order, he becomes a reactionary. The serious manager of a street railway company is not content with the simple duty of transporting passengers cheaply and comfortably. He wants to exercise the functions of a lecturer in an ethical culture society. While the transported victim is swaying precariously from the end of a strap, he reads a notice urging him to practice Christian courtesy and not to push. While the poor wretch pours over this counsel of perfection, he feels like answering, as did Junius, to the Duke of Grafton, My lord, injuries may be atoned for and forgiven, but insults admit of no compensation. A man enters a barber shop with the simple desire of being shaved, but he meets with the more ambitious desires of the barber. The serious barber is not content with any slight contribution to human welfare. He insists that his client shall be shampooed, manicured, massaged, steamed beneath boiling towels, cooled off by electric fans, and, while all this is going on, that he shall have his boots blacked. Have you never marveled at the patience of people and having so many things done for them that they don't want, just to avoid hurting the feelings of professional people who want to do more than is expected of them? You watch the stoical countenance of the passenger in a Pullman car as he stands up to be brushed. The chances are that he doesn't want to be brushed. He would prefer to leave the dust on his coat rather than to be compelled to swallow it. But he knows what is expected of him. It is a part of the solemn ritual of traveling. It precedes the offering. The fact that every man desires to be somebody else explains many of the aberrations of artists and literary men. The painters, dramatists, musicians, poets, and novelists are just as human as housemaids and railway managers and porters. They want to do all the good they can do to all the people they can in all the ways they can. They get tired of the ways they are used to and like to try new combinations, so they are continually mixing things. The practitioner of one art tries to produce effects that are proper to another art. A musician wants to be a painter and use his violin as if it were a brush. He would have us see the sunset glories that he is painting for us. A painter wants to be a musician and paint symphonies, and he is grieved because the uninstructed cannot hear his pictures, although the colors do swear at each other. Another painter wants to be an architect and build up his picture as if it were made of cubes of brick. It looks like brickwork, but to the natural eye it doesn't look like a picture. A prose writer gets tired of writing prose and wants to be a poet, so he begins every line with a capital letter and keeps on writing prose. You go to the theater with the simple-minded Shakespearean idea that the play's the thing, but the playwright wants to be a pathologist, so you discover that you have dropped into a gruesome clinic. You sought innocent relaxation, but you are one of the non-elect and have gone to the place prepared for you. You must see the thing through. The fact that you have troubles of your own is not a sufficient claim for exemption. Or you take up a novel, expecting it to be a work of fiction. But the novelist has other views. He wants to be your spiritual advisor. He must do something to your mind. He must rearrange your fundamental ideas. He must massage your soul and generally brush you off. All this in spite of the fact that you don't want to be brushed off and set to rights. You don't want him to do anything to your mind. It's the only mind you have, and you need it in your own business. Part 3 But if the desire of every man to be somebody else accounts for many whimsicalities of human conduct, 
and for many aberrations in the arts, it cannot be lightly dismissed as belonging only to the realm of comedy. It has its origin in the nature of things. The reason why every man wants to be somebody else is that he can remember the time when he was somebody else. What we call personal identity is a very changeable thing, as all of us realize when we look over old photographs and read old letters. The oldest man now living is but a few years removed from the undifferentiated germplasm, which might have developed into almost anything. In the beginning, he was a bundle of possibilities. Every actuality that is developed means a decrease in the rich variety of possibilities. In becoming one thing, it becomes impossible to be something else. The delight in being a boy lies in the fact that the possibilities are still manifold. The boy feels that he can be anything that he desires. He is conscious that he has capabilities that would make him a successful banker. On the other hand, there are attractions in a life of adventure in the South Seas. It would be pleasant to lie under a breadfruit tree and let the fruit drop into his mouth to the admiration of the gentle savages who would gather about him. Or he might be a saint, not a commonplace modern saint who does chores and attends tiresome committee meetings, but a saint such as one who reads about, who gives away his rich robes, and his purse of gold to the first beggar he meets, and then goes on his carefree way through the forest to convert interesting robbers. He feels that he might practice that kind of unscientific charity if his father would furnish him with the money to give away. But by and by he learns that making a success in the banking business is not consistent with excursions to the South Seas or with the more picturesque and unusual forms of saintliness. If he is to be in a bank, he must do as the bankers do. Parents and teachers conspire together to make a man of him, which means making a particular kind of man of him. All mental processes which are not useful must be suppressed. The sum of their admonitions is that he must pay attention. That is precisely what he is doing. He is paying attention to a variety of things that escape the adult mind. As he wriggles on the bench in the schoolroom, he pays attention to all that is going on. He attends to what is going on out of doors. He sees the weak points of his fellow pupils, against whom he is planning punitive expeditions. And he is delightfully conscious of the idiosyncrasies of the teacher. Moreover, he is a youthful artist, and his sketches from life give acute joy to his contemporaries when they are furtively passed around. But the schoolmaster says sternly, My boy, you must learn to pay attention. That is to say, you must not pay attention to so many things, but you must pay attention to one thing, namely the second declension. Now the second declension is the least interesting thing in the room, but unless he confines his attention to it, he will never learn it. Education demands narrowing of attention in the interest of efficiency. A man may, by dint of application to a particular subject, become a successful merchant or a real estate man or chemist or overseer of the poor, but he cannot be all these things at the same time. He must make his choice. Having, in the presence of witnesses, taken himself for better or worse, he must, forsaking all others, cleave to that alone. The consequence is that by the time he is forty, he has become one kind of a man and he is able to do one kind of work. He has acquired a stock of ideas, true enough for his purposes, but not so transcendentally true as to interfere with his business. His neighbors know where to find him. They do not need to take a spiritual elevator. He does his business on the ground floor. He has gained in practicality, but has lost in the quality of interestingness. The old prophet declared that the young men dream dreams, and the old men see visions but he did not say anything about the middle-aged men. They have to look after the business end. But has the man whose working hours are so full of responsibilities changed so much as he seems to have done? When he is talking shop, is he all there? I think not. There are elusive personalities that are in hiding. As the rambling mansions of the old Catholic families had secret panels opening into the priest's hole, to which the family resorted for spiritual comfort, 
so in the mind of the most successful man there are secret chambers where are hidden his unsuccessful ventures his romantic ambitions his unfulfilled promises all that he dreamed of as possible is somewhere concealed in the man's heart he would not for the world have the public know how much he cares for the selves that have not had a fair chance to come into the light of day you do not know a man until you know his lost atlantis and his utopia for which he still hopes to set sail when dogberry asserted that he was as pretty a piece of flesh as any in messina and one that hath two gowns and everything handsome about him he was pointing out what he deemed to be quite obvious it was in a more intimate tone that he boasted and a fellow that hath had losses when julius caesar rode through the streets of rome in his chariot his laurel crown seemed to the populace a symbol of his present greatness but gossip has it that caesar at that time desired to be younger than he was and that before appearing in public he carefully arranged his laurel wreath so as to conceal the fact that he had had losses much that passes for pride in the behavior of the great comes from the fear of the betrayal of emotions that belong to a simpler manner of life when the sons of jacob saw the great egyptian officer to whom they appealed turn away from them they little knew what was going on and joseph made haste for his bowels did yearn upon his brother and he sought where to weep and he entered into his chamber and wept there and he washed his face and went out and refrained himself joseph didn't want to be a great man he wanted to be human it was hard to refrain himself part four what of the lost arts of childhood the lost audacities and ambitions and romantic admirations of adolescence what becomes of the sympathies which make us feel our kinship to all sorts of people what becomes of the early curiosity in regard to things which were none of our business we ask as st paul asked of the galatians ye began well who did hinder you the answer is not wholly to our discredit we do not develop all parts of our nature because we are not allowed to do so walt whitman might exult over the spontaneous me but nobody is paid for being spontaneous a spontaneous switchman on the railway would be a menace to the traveling public we prefer someone less temperamental as civilization advances and work becomes more specialized it becomes impossible for anyone to find free and full development for all his natural powers in any recognized occupation what then becomes of the other selves the answer must be that playgrounds must be provided for them outside the confines of daily business as work becomes more engrossing and narrowing the need is more urgent for recognized and carefully guarded periods of leisure the old hebrew sage declared wisdom cometh from the opportunity of leisure it does not mean that a wise man must belong to what we call the leisure classes it means that if one has only a little free time at his disposal he must use that time for the refreshment of his hidden selves if he cannot have a sabbath rest of twenty-four hours he must learn to sanctify little sabbaths it may be of ten minutes length in them he shall do no manner of work it is not enough that the self that works and receives wages shall be recognized and protected the world must be made safe for our other selves does not the declaration of independence say that every man has an inalienable right to the pursuit of happiness the old-time minister after he had exhorted the believers at considerable length used to turn to a personage who for homiletical purposes was known as the objector to him he addressed his most labored arguments at this point i am conscious of the presence of the objector all you say he remarks in praise of your favorite platitude is true to a fault but what has all this to do with the war there is only one thing in these days worth thinking about at least it is the only thing we can think about i agree with you courteous objector no matter where we start we all come back to this point who was to blame for the war and how is it coming out our explanatory idea has a direct bearing on the question before us 
the Prussian militarists had a painstaking knowledge of facts, but they had a contempt for human nature. Their tactlessness was almost beyond belief. They treated persons as if they were things. They treated facts with deadly seriousness, but had no regard for feelings. They had spies all over the world to report all that could be seen, but they took no account of what could not be seen. So, while they were dealing scientifically with the obvious facts and forces, all the hidden powers of the human soul were being turned against them. Prussianism insists on highly specialized men who have no sympathies to interfere with their efficiency. Having adopted a standard, all variation must be suppressed. It is against this effort to suppress the human variations that we are fighting. We don't want all men to be reduced to one pattern. But what about the Kaiser? Does your formula explain him? Does he want to be somebody else? I confess, dear objector, that is probably a new idea to him, but he may come to it. End of Every Man's Natural Desire to Be Somebody Else Recording by Wayne Anderson, Chelsea, Quebec. Chapter 5 of Atlantic Classics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Temple's Difficult Door by Robert M. Gay. Do you remember the little old white church which, when we were boys, we attended more or less unwillingly, according to the season, with the stiff back pews in which we sat aching, counting the pipes in the organ and the balusters in the altar rail and the dentals in the molding of the pulpit? Of course you remember it, and the little old lady who sat in the corner ejaculating her hallelujahs and amens with the regularity of a cock -a clock and the solemn presenter who sought out the time with his hand, and the preacher who took his text from the Old Testament, and wrote the names of the ten tribes and their enemies as a sweet morsel under his tongue. The little old lady, you can recollect, was valiant in prayer meeting. She was not afraid to criticize the minister, or to repeat week by week the story of her conversion in her ninth year. Nor did she fail continually to impress upon us boys, facing us sometimes with uplifted finger, the eminence of him who goeth to and fro in the earth and rageth like lion, seeking whom he may devour. Ah, those prayer meetings! Shall we, shall we ever forget them? Or the references to the sinners who sat on the back row where we always sat? Or the wailing hymns? Or the dismal testimonies? of the waves of dejection that swept over us during the cataloging of our omissions and commissions. And there was always a boy. Do you remember him? A boy of our own age, mind you. A boy who ostentatiously arose and with the decorum of a deacon dwelt upon his former iniquities and present beatitude. We expected this of an occasional girl, yet the girls never did it. A mumbled text, a florid word or two, for the extent of their temerity. As for us, it was not our custom to discuss our souls even amongst ourselves. It is said that to forget the existence of a stomach is the best symptom of health in that useful organ. And, if the analogy holds, our souls must have been singularly robust. We were bashful about our virtues and vices. We could not fathom the sentiments of take time to be holy. We were in mortal fear that some day somebody might convict us of sin and hail us forthwith into the fold of the elect. Yet here he was a boy who flaunted his goodness in our faces. It was evident that he was not normal, that it lay with us as a duty to puncture the bumble of his presumptuousness. The time came, you remember, very opportunely. On a memorable evening, it was announced that this infant Samuel as the little old lady called him, was to recite to the congregation the entire book of Esther from memory. For us, who found it beyond our power to remember a golden text of ten words for ten minutes, such a performance was unbelievable. We put our heads together and evolved the plot, dark yet charming in its simple effectiveness. 
we decided to make faces at him. We were expert in the art of face making because we had practiced it for weeks upon our sisters who sang in the choir. They had suffered but were now immune. The grimaces of our Grimaldi could not have ruffled the calm of their scornful features. We planted ourselves in the front row and the boy began his recital. In time, his preoccupied and lackluster eye wandered in our direction and rested upon us. He started, looked away, stammered, recovered, and went bravely on. But we knew that he would look back. He dared not glance at our neighbors, but had faith that each was doing his duty. Of course he did look back, but why prolong the mournful tale? It is sufficient to say that Aster and Osiris remained unwedded and Haman unhung, and that our victim retired amid the titterings of the judicious and the commiserations of the pious, while we plumed ourselves upon a difficult task laudably accomplished. I have indulged in this long reminiscence, which probably can be matched in the experience of my most masculine readers, because it is provocative of thoughts that deserve to be aired. An essay might be written upon the pathos that lies in the spectacle of a boy who is incited to a public display of his goodness, in the docility which is as clay in the hands of deluded adults. That he suffered, there can be no doubt. Not one half so much under the ordeal of our contriving, which, I hope, cured him, as under the isolation which he, his dedication to goodness made inevitable. He was a lonely boy, though he may not have realized that he was, that he could never understand his fellows or be understood by them was impossible. He was the victim of the most perverse fate that can afflict a boy. He had been born in the bosom of a family whose piety contained not a grain of the salt of humor, not a particle of the leaven of imagination, not, but I am forgetting. I wish to ask the reader's consideration, not of the victim, but of the tormentors. Why is it that boys are suspicious of that approximate moral perfection called goodness? Girls find a deep satisfaction in being good, in being neat, in being clean, in being decorous. If they are not these, we call them tomboys, still casting the onus of sinfulness upon the other sex. When we boys confided our exploit to little girls, we found that they openly defended the boy, though it must be admitted they privately admired us as is the way of their sex. Our fathers, informed by our sisters and instigated by our mothers, solemnly reproach us, but with a twinkle that would not be hidden. Manifestly, the trail of the serpent was over them too. They were sorry that they had not sat in the choir. The meekest of men loved to tell how bad they were as boys, hugging their fiction of early depravity with an unregenerate glee. The more innocuous they may be now, the more they love to boast, especially to their wives, of this phantasmal wild oats. The ladies pretend to be shocked at the stories, but are glad to believe them, and so it is not surprising if some men, in their fear of being mistaken for saints, remain boys all their lives. The pursuit of the ideal is complicated by man's suspicion of goodness, and by woman's curious but characteristic indecision whether to espouse perfection for imperfection, gifted with a natural propensity towards virtue and propriety with a neatness and respectability and all the other approximate perfections of life, attaining them with ease and wearing them with grace. She of course values them little enough in man. His foibles interest her more than his virtues. She admires even while she condemns. He, because he is a man, prefers admiration to commendation. In education, man as a rule inculcates ideals of perfection without pretending to practice them, but woman with an iron logic with which man's aspersions to the contrary notwithstanding is characteristic of her, not only points but leads the way. Hence it is that some teachers of her sex have two manners, the human for social occasions and the divine for the classroom. In the privacy of their homes, they have imperfections. In the classroom, they are icily perfect. Their perfectness extends to such detail as facial expression 
and tonal voice. Occasionally, a man adopts the duplex character, but with deplorable result. I remember such a one in high school. Those of us who had the good fortune to meet him socially found that his peccadillos of character, manner, and language, but in the school he was a pattern which we despaired of imitating. From his necktie to his reading of Burke's conciliation, he was without spot or blemish. We did not dare to love him. We gave up all hope of emulation. We nicknamed him Mrs. Dawson and let it go at that. But women carry this dual character more successfully than men, whether because they are better actors or because we confuse saintliness with femininity. Even as boys, we are ready to forgive it and them. To the little girls, it seems perfectly natural. They catch the idea readily and practice their teacher's positions and pruderies upon the family. We must admit, too, that in the art of being a pattern, women show a sterner conscientiousness than men. They are not constitutionally so lazy. It requires hard and sustained effort to be a pattern, an inveterate and dogged attention to detail. It is chiefly here that we men fail. The male saints, witness Jerome, had a time of it with their petty temptations, simply because sainthood is largely a matter of detail. Most men are good enough in essentials, but fail in the little things, the little things of which woman is enamored too often. The slave, to be perfect, gives her a satisfaction that men will never understand, and, prompted by the constitutional laziness aforesaid, he takes refuge in calling goodness womanish. His institutions, therefore, are good enough in, in essentials. His political organizations and governments, his bureaus and offices and federations and unions, all are nobly planned, but lack the feminine touch that makes for perfection. His streets are dirty, and so are his politics. His laws need dusting. A little sweeping would not hurt his governments. His various organizations would be none the worse for some polishing and weeding, and clipping off loose threads and sewing up ants and various other species of revamping. All these last subtleties are beyond him, just as, be he never so neat, are all the tiny sweetnesses and refinements and knots and bows and satisfying knickknacks of his wife's person. She is a creature of succombs and nuances and intuitive niceties. She can endure no compromise with disorder or dirt or decay. Her modes are all beams until they are demolished. She uses a mountain of faith to move a mustard seed. She cannot see the polished surface for the speck of dust that is on it. In her extreme development, she spends her life doing the million and one trifles that men would leave undone. The trouble is that, not satisfied with all this, she longs to make him perfect too. Never deterred by the stupendousness of the task, she goes on, century by century, generation by generation, teaching him, preaching to him, marrying him, gently reading him, or tyrannously compelling him toward the heaven of her ideal. And here again her gaze is microscopic. In her attention to his fables, she is liable to overlook his sins. She can seldom understand badness in boys, nor can she ever see that the boy who is most bad in small matters may be the most good in large. She loves to keep her male offspring lamb-like and tries his docility by making him wear long hair and white colors and linen and ruffles and lace, never learning but through hard experience that, like the puppy, he takes naturally to mud and fields at ease, only close to the soil. When he at last rubbles and privately snips off his hair and rends his sashes and fur bellows, she weeps, not because of the loss of material, but because of the loss of an ideal. And who can blame her? It is seldom enough in this world that we can kiss and fondle an ideal, except in dreams. I have a theory that our school laws should be revised and we should confide our grammar school teaching of boys only to women who have been married. My reason is not the one reader is imagining. However, it is not because she will have had children. No, I do not go that far as that. 
I merely demand that she shall have had a husband. He is quite sufficient. He is a male. A year's association with him will have softened her fire, will have aroused in her mind doubts of the perfectibility of mankind. Then, then she will be ready to teach boys. Yet it must be admitted that every teacher who has managed to remain human is confronted by a dilemma. As a teacher, he, expect, he is expected to inculcate ideals of perfection, not only in studies, but in deportment. And yet, when he happens to come upon a student who approaches perfection, it is a mournful occasion. The student may be admirable, but he is dull company. It has been suggested that teaching can be a satisfying profession only to very big to, or very little natures. I suppose that the idea is that the big nature sees the future in the instant, tolerates the perfect imperfection, dreaming of a distant flawlessness, while the little nature satisfies himself by attaining perfections and trifles. The average man or woman who has drifted into the profession is saved from despair or insanity by that biological interest and, and curiosity about humanity, which we call humor. He knows that everlasting concern with perfection and trifles is a belittler of souls, that correcting sentences and paragraphs and Latin and German exercises and algebraic problems and geometrical proofs if is poor food for a human mind. For on the other hand, instinct tells him that the larger perfection is cold, that it dwells in the rarefied air of the mountain tops, that it is unhuman. To love the derelict student is treason to his profession. Yet as he looks back over the long line of pupils who have passed through his hands, he sees that the ones who remain warm and vivid in his memory are those who fell short of the very ideals which he tried to inculcate. Among all the students in a certain school, I have a living recollection of just one, and he was the most imperfect student in it. He refused to study. He refused to behave. He insisted on fighting and bringing snakes to school in his pocket and I do not exaggerate, standing on his head in the middle of a recitation. He passed most of his days sitting in the headmaster's office, studying demurely when that gentleman was present and making paper flying machines when surveillance relaxed. Yet, as I search my heart, I find that my memories of him are pleasant, that I should like to see him again, even at the price of having to recapture his garter snakes or of having to turn him right side up during a recitation. He was much misunderstood. Some of his teachers, having no faith in my theory of the interestingness of the imperfect, found him a thorn in the flesh and predicted him for a sudden end by suspension. And there were doubtless times when, in an excess of impatience, I longed for the end to come, as was ready to officiate it. He shattered the pedagogic ideal. Try as I would, I was unable to discover her in him ideals of any sort, and he refused to adopt any that I offered, however edifying. Yet all the good little boys to whom he administered black eyes with the utmost generosity have faded from my memory, and he stands out the brighter for the years that have gone. If he, had in, if he had been good, he too would long since have been consigned to the limbo of the dream of things that were viewed in the narrow light of class discipline. He was a burden, like the grasshopper, in the broad and genial growth that falls from a humorous philosophy of life. He was a joy, a heart-filling atomy of mischief, a triumphant example of the imperfectness of humanity and the humanness of imperfection. We can postulate so much of the imperfect thing and so little of the perfect. Flawlessness leaves the weaker imagination so little to take hold of. It is slippery, even woman, with that inconsistency which makes her adorable, really loves perfection no more than we. Everyone knows that a little girl loves an, an old doll, or a rag doll, or a one-legged doll, better than the most expensive Parisian wax doll with real hair and eyes that open and shut. The Parisian beauty has been long for, for months, but now 
that it has become an entity. It leaves the child cold. If it is so lucky as to lose an arm or some sawdust, there may be hope for it. But so long as it remains new and whole, it can never hope to enter the warmest precincts of the little girl's heart. To keep inside perfection, says a contemporary poet, is the artist's best delight, and his bitterest pang that he can do no more than that. Yet, in another epigram, the same poet speaks as follows. The thousand painful steps at last are trod. At last, the temple's difficult door we win. Perfect upon his pedestal, the god freezes us hopeless when we enter it. The little girl is tasting this experience, the contemplation of elastic joints, mechanical eyes, and waxen complexion warm the cockles of her heart, but the embodiment of these in a palpable doll freezes her hopeless. If the poet with more imagination suffers too, and the higher natures, those which we call the transcendental, with the sadness that lies in the attainment of the perfect, Surely, the unimaginative mass of mankind can be excused if they find the interlunar regions chilly. In reckless moments, I wonder whether the Greek statues did not suffer more happily at the hands of fate when they lost their arms and heads and legs than we are accustomed to think, whether their dilapidation has not given them a place in our hearts instead of merely in our heads, has not couched them in our love instead of merely pedestal them in our reverence. Or, to take an illustration from a lower plane, may it not be that we get a keener pleasure out of eating an imperfect apple? It is neither the best possible apple, which would be perfect, nor the worst possible apple, which would have a kind of negative perfection. It has a worm at the core, but I wonder whether we do not enjoy it more because we have to eat more carefully to keep from eating him. Besides, he arouses in our mind all sorts of questionings. Why is he there? What kind, what kind of worm is he? How did he get in? How would he have got out if we had not ousted him? And note this, what sort of an apple would it have been if he had taken up his residence elsewhere? I am rather proud of this little apple to apple, for the perfect apple could have roused no curies which the defective apple does not. The same subtle influences went to make both, the same elements, the same forces, the same chemical processes, but the defective apple has, in addition to all these, the worm. There is some strangeness even in beauty. The perfect rhythm is intolerable. We demand chiaroscuro in life as in color. The preciousness of the ointment is the more evident for the fly. We love people for their vices, so the vices do not make them despicable. If the gods that sit above have a sense of humor, they must find us grown men and women as funny and as sad as we find boys and girls and dogs. Not knowing the sentiment of the gods, we have to content ourselves with those of the poets and humorists who, we fondly imagine, have in them something of the godlike vision. They look at humanity from above, and they find that the spectacle of humanity trying to be what it cannot be, facing both ways, on the threshold of heaven, casting a longing, lingering look behind, is comic and tragic in its very essence. For comedy and tragedy differ chiefly in degree. In the imperfection of humanity lie its tragedy and its humor. Without it, this will be a happier world, but with this, it is a merrier. End of the Temple's Difficult Door Chapter 6 of Atlantic Classics this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. Exile and Postman 
by jean kenyon mackenzie it used to make me homesick in our little african clearing to see the albino woman she would move about among her brown companions like a flame and her white body that flickered in the sun and glimmered in the shade used to knock at the door of nostalgia homesick people always long for a visit and that albino was so white once to our neighborhood where in those days white women did not come there came a white woman she did not lodge with us she lodged with the white officer because she was an officer's wife we used to wonder if she would call upon us one of us had a pair of field glasses and we used to watch her little figure coming and going about the clearing on the government hill when one day she was seen to come down into our valley by the zigzag trail we thought we had a visit i cannot tell you how anxious we were in that little bark house to make a good appearance or what fresh disposals were made with our eyes upon that descent of our properties i do not wish to make you too sad but that white woman did not visit us she went away she did not know about us or about exiles that they are always dreaming of a visit it seems a hard thing sometimes when night closes the doors of all the little trails that the day is passed without a visitor it is true of exiles that they have the most unreasonable expectations of the sort based perhaps upon the migrations of swallows and not relinquished until the hour of dusk yes then the little trails of the forest are perceived by the mind's eye which like a cat's eyes sees them better for the dark to wander away into an infinite distance and a solitude dusk is altogether the most illuminating hour for the exile he then knows so exactly where he is he has a perfectly visual sense of his surroundings he sees where he is but how came he to be there the geography of his circumstance is plain but not the logic he who has no other companions than himself suspects this companion in that hour of dusk to be a fool it must be a poor fool he thinks who has drifted into such a clearing by such a river the forest of the cameroon is as good a place as any to be homesick but i will not be saying that the members of my profession and i am a missionary are chronic sufferers missionaries are in the main gay and for excellent reasons some of them pagan reasons for they are little brothers of antaeus some of them christian reasons for they are of the company of successful fishermen a fisherman with a good catch can defy even the dusk his string of silver fish is a lantern to his feet no if there were an altar and a service to placate nostalgia it would not be that fisherman who would most attend that service the path to that altar would be worn brown by the feet of the trader i think the trader is lonelier than the missionaries are he is better versed in solitude he goes into the forest with a backward look he comes out of the forest sometimes with a secret and a stricken countenance more than missionaries do he does more often than they he builds out of his lonely horror and the license of solitude a perverse habitation for his soul sometimes and this is very sad he is afraid he lingers and lingers on the margin of that green sea of forest the heart say the bulu has gone to hide in the dark and this is a bulu way of saying that the heart is not worn upon the sleeve well upon the sleeve of the white drill suits that beach traders wear there is i will agree no device of hearts but those lonely inland traders those that have traveled ten twenty thirty days from their kind what is that they sometimes seem to wear upon the sleeve of their singlets and who cares where he wears his heart if there is never a white man's eye to fall upon it in those little bark huts on the trading posts where young white men pale with the passing hours there comes to be a careless fashion in wear whether of hearts or of collars in the warm dusk of those little houses where there is an earthen floor where there are tin trade boxes as bright as jockeys jackets where there are trade cloths printed with violent designs where there is salt fish and cheap scent and tobacco 
where all these desirable things may be had for ivory and rubber. There the trader may wear his heart upon his sleeve without shame. None of those brilliant eyes set in those dark faces know a white man's heart when they see it. There in his hut is a monotony of brown bodies, quick with vehement gestures. There is a tumult of controversy in a tongue he does not know. The sudden glitter of brass ornament is there, and the glitter of brass spears. There are fantastic headdresses studded with buttons and shells and beads, and scented with the odor of wood fires. Between those brown bodies and the body of the white man lies the counter. More lies between them than this. There are between them such barriers that the white man is not more lonely when he is alone. Yet how still it is of an idle day under the thatched leaves of that little house. The sun does its exaggerated violence to the yellow earth of the clearing. The forest hangs its hours over its secret. How far it is, in this place not named on the map, from Manchester? How, when the rain falls, it is other than rainfall on the Clyde? How the pale fruit that hangs high on the Ajap tree is not like the apples that ripen in Wishaw? Do not speak of apples. Nostalgia, in her cruel equipment, carries a scented phantom apple. At night there is about that young trader a trouble of drums that never rest. There is the sharp concerted cry of the dancers. There is the concerted wail for the dead. There is about him all the rhythmic beating of the mysterious life of his neighborhood, tormenting him when he lies under his mosquito net. For this he will rise and walk about, the ember of his pipe drifting back and forth in the dark, and his gramophone, roused by himself, making its limited, obedient effort. There is this about a gramophone. It is a thing that speaks the home tongue. I have seen him sitting under the eaves of his little hut, by his little table spread with a checkered cloth, his gramophone beside him, trying, with his tail of the old grouse gunroom, to divert that lonely meal. Now that I think of it, the gramophone is a kind of hero of my little piece a kind of David with five tunes, to do battle with nostalgia. Back in the tent broods Saul, and his poor patient David plays the endless round of five tunes, until some day there is a javelin in the wall, and a proud black man goes away with a gramophone into the wilderness. The night sky does more permanent ministry to the homesick, and of all the bright ministers, the moon is the most effectual. It is the great reflector of lights. There it comes, swinging up its old path in the sky, and the fires of a home are mirrored in its disk. You who read have spread your hands, in your hour of homesickness, to those phantom fires, and other hands are always spread. Some of us were sitting on our heels about a little flame in a new clearing. All of us were alien in that clearing. One of us was white. And the black woman said to the white woman, when the moonlight fell upon all those women faces, the moon looks upon the villages and upon the home village. We black people, when we sit in the towns of strangers and the moon shines, we say, now by the light of this same moon, the people at home dance to the drums. However far we walk, we look upon the moon and we remember our friends at home. Upon another moonlit night, sitting in a forest camp with young black girls for companions, these sang for me a little set of songs. The songs, they told me, of the moon. Ah, mon zip, alu adanya, ah, mon zip. Ah, little gazelle, the night has deepened, ah, little gazelle. This little refrain they sang, clapping their hands ever so lightly, and the meaning of the singing was a warning. It was a song of the moon, a song for wanderers, and the moon on that remembered night, dragging its net of broken silver cords in among the trees of the forest, caught everywhere the wandering hearts and drew them back on the little rough trails to the home fires. Every night that is a moonlight night, there is the casting of that silver net upon the far rivers and forests, and forests deeper than rivers, wherever aliens make a bed of leaves or sleep on a canvas cot. On such a night, and caught in such a net, I have met the postman. 
Yes, on just such a night, when the world appeared as it hangs in space, a crystal globe, and when so observed from a little clearing in an African forest, it was seen to be charted for voyagers, and all its little paths ran readily about the globe to that gilt side which is home. On such a night and upon such a path, I met the postman. To hang upon a little wicket gate under the moon at the end of a moon-filled clearing in a breach of the forest, to see the black body of the postman suddenly darken the checkered light upon the path from the west, how to speak of this adventure with moderation, how to speak of postmen at all with moderation, and of those postmen who thread the lonely forests of the world, their loads upon their backs, their rations of salt fish on top of their loads, how to recall their aspects, their monthly or bi-monthly or semi-annual arrivals, the priceless treasures they carry, how speak of these things to men and women who have never followed the little gazelle into the forests where the night has deepened, who have never felt the divinity in postmen. Imagine that there is a people in this world who let a postman walk up the path unattended, and who wait until he knocks on the door, who do not shout to their neighbors when they receive a letter, and who receive one every day. These items alone prove the truth of the Bulu proverb that there are tribes and tribes, and customs and customs. And I will agree that there are, even on the trails of the wilderness, postmen and postmen. There are even, though I hate to dwell upon it, postmen whom I do not trust. Not all postmen have wings upon their heels. The ideal postman does, of course, fly. He is like the bird let loose in eastern skies when hastening fondly home. He avoids idle wanderers, but they do not all do so. I remember to have been wakened one night in a village by the gossip of two old headmen. They had met before my tent. There in the moonlight they chatted together. All the little life of the village was sleeping. The two old men alone were abroad. They were about the business of the post. It is a pioneer custom in Africa east and west, that the white man's local letter is franked from town to town. The black man to whom the white man gives his letter carries it to the headman of the next settlement, who carries it in turn to his brother headman down the trail. And so from hand to hand, by day and by night, with a glance from any passing white man, the letter goes forward. Such a letter carried as the custom is, in a split rod from which there hung, like a flag, a bit of turkey red, changed hands that night before my tent, and now I write it in a white man's book that the postman loitered. To stand and chat there in the moonlight with the exile's letter in your hands, how could you do that, you two old heartless headmen? I watched you from my little green tent. It is remembered of you that you so delayed, while in some lonely hamlet under that same moon a white man sickened for a letter. And when one gave that forked stick to the other, it was then too late. If indeed, as you would say, you spoke no more than five words of gossip one to the other, those words were five too many. It is remembered of you, and a thousand nights since, when I have waited for the mail, if it were a moonlight night, I have told myself with an extreme self-pity and a bitterness, the carrier is gossiping in some clearing. I have seen in my heart that man with a load of mail upon his back, standing for hours by a friend of his, laughing and asking news one of the other. This conjured vision of two black men holding up the mail is the sad issue of an imagination infected beyond cleansing. You see, I saw them do it. Some postmen have come in late because their feet were sore. And some, in passing through their home town, have permitted themselves an illness or a marriage. Some have waited, with the mail in their loads, to bury the dead. Such a postman, so given to misadventures and clumsy ill-timed tragedies, was once late to the tune of eleven days. Who remembers what delayed him or what exquisite reasons he gave? And who of us in that little clearing forgets the long hours of that year of days? 
another postman of an extreme beauty and an extreme speed arrived before his time there was a shouting when he came all the inhabitants of that little settlement of white men called to each other the four or five of them filled a room of a bark house those white faces that were growing daily like the face of the osra blitch und blitcher were all lit by the flame of the mail in all that little commonwealth with its pioneer trades and its pioneer gardens and its pioneer hospital and school and church in all that settlement all the busy crude wheels of industry slackened and stood still while the white men opened the load of the mail now they will be reading the books from home and of a bengi that young carrier it is still remembered that he arrived before he was due ah a bengi you still say to him from time to time that was a fine walking you walked that walk so long ago when you slept but three nights with the mail another postman never to be forgotten by those exiles whom he served never came at all this was a boy too young you would think for his great office the letters in his little pack were from husbands to wives and they must travel a hundred miles of forest trail in time of war not twenty miles they traveled when the postman surrounded by black soldiers was called to deliver he did not deliver he could not give the white man's letters to another hand he said no he could not and for this they killed him that young body tarried forever upon the trail witnessing in that interminable delay as abengi had witnessed in his swift coming to the sacred element in the mail here is the king's touch for the king's evil the hand of the postman dropping a letter for this the victims of nostalgia do long service for this they scribble in their lonely and various dwellings their letters there is a night in those alien settlements all about the world that is unlike other nights it is the night before the mail is closed the lamp is full of oil that night and the cup of coffee is at the elbow on and on while the stars march the white man's hand runs upon the page in villages where there are no street lamps the white man's window is a lamp all night of the night before the mail from steamers that are tied to trees among the rushes in rivers that you do not know the officer on watch may look all night through such a window at such a man writing writing a long long letter the beating heart of man articulate in all that heartless darkness how quick a seed you would say the seed in such a letter how such a letter must bear some sixty some hundredfold yet myself i saw this i saw the harbor master of kambinda a settlement of white men on the west coast of africa come aboard the monthly steamer to get the mail he was an old portuguese coffee colored in his gray linen suit a long time he had been harbor master and many times he had taken the brown bag of mail ashore this day when he lifted his bag he hefted it the lightness of it in his hand made him smile some irony that was the fruit of his long experience of exiles and their letters made that old indifferent man curl the lip i think that in cabinda that night there went white men hungry to bed i would not like to live in cabinda where the postman is so old and so wise these white postmen know too much they can count more than ten and other things they know they know a thing too sad to tell better a bengi who ran so swiftly with his load or little esam who thought that for a load of letters some would even dare to die End of Exile in Postman Chapter 7 of Atlantic Classics This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Wayne Anderson, Chelsea, Quebec. The Life of Adventure by Edgar J. Goodspeed adventures said the gifted mr disraeli are to the adventurous stevenson somewhere recommends the conception of life as a series of adventures each morning witnessing as it were 
a new embarkation upon some treasure quest or feat of arms and i have often observed that my adventurous friends have a knack of reporting with all the flavor of genuine adventures experiences which upon sober reflection seem rather to fade into the light of common day it would appear therefore that it is they who put the adventurous into life rather than that life is responsible in this fact lies much encouragement for one whose life seems set in a routine of commonplace who lives upon a decent city street where even burglars seldom penetrate and nothing more exciting than automobile collisions ordinarily happens these last are however of a gratifying frequency if it is excitement that one craves indeed we have laterally come to a weary sense of annoyance when the familiar crunch informs us that two motorists have simultaneously claimed the right-of-way the pious duty of sweeping up all that was mortal of these unfortunates sometimes becomes really distressing and one feels like a modern tobit keeping watch or man's mortality i make it a point never to witness these distressing occurrences that would be a vocation in itself only when the fatal crash is heard do i emerge like esculapius from his temple i was a witness once but only in a burglary i had not of course seen the burglary but i could still remember seeing the corpus delecti in situ as it were later than anyone else and the proof that the object had existed had of course to precede the evidence that it had disappeared such is the logic of the law twenty several times i accordingly visited the halls of justice and twenty several mornings i sacrificed upon the altar of duty months wore on we witnesses from our frequent meetings came to be firm friends we talked of forming a permanent organization we even began to produce a literature though all that i now remember of it is for we're trying johnny artzel in the morning i became so seasoned and habitué of the court building that belated witnesses for other tribunals on reaching the witness room would rush up to me and explain in broken english that they had been detained that they had come as fast as they could and hoped i would excuse them showing that there was nothing about me that looked out of place in the precincts of the criminal court but with all this assiduity we did not convict our burglar the kindly judge reduced his bail that he might rejoin his family he seized the opportunity to filch some golden teeth which a prosperous dentist had destined for his fashionable clients and this irate gentleman thrust in his case ahead of ours though the statute of limitations had not yet run against us and thus snatched from us the satisfaction of immuring our defendant in his deserved dungeon this is why i never witness motor accidents but it is plain that even this unhappy business may take on the glamour of romance when approached from the point of view of adventure the other morning when the familiar crunch informed us that we were again to function as first aids to broken humanity i rushed into the street to see a large limousine of the eight passenger type now usual at obsequies resting comfortably on its port side in the opposite parkway what might it not contain in the way of youth beauty and interest yet in point of fact when its cargo had been laboriously hoisted up through the main hatch which was ordinarily its right-hand door it proved to be nothing very romantic after all and we gave it its coffee with a certain vague sense of disappointment some people really are not worthy of adventure and it is a great pity that many who have adventures refuse to accept them gratefully in an adventurous spirit war is of course the main avenue to adventure and even so commonplace an affair as military drill has at least in its early stages adventurous possibilities our corporal for i have to admit that i am only a private as yet being one day kept from duty by a seminar on plato an expert on the history of art excluding that of war was set over us his eagerness exceeded his experience and it is not too much to say that he led us into places of danger previously unsuspected the company though with the gravest misgivings was called upon to deploy as skirmishers guide left placing himself at our head and crying follow me our gallant leader at once set off at a double quick in the wrong direction 
where a lieutenant, much out of breath, overtook us, crying, Hey, Corporal, you belong at the other end of the line. Follow me, ordered our leader, unabashed, and we double-quicked to the other end, there to meet the other lieutenant, with the cry, Hey, Corporal, you belong in the middle of the line. But one of our most inflexible deans occupied the middle with his squad, and his conception of military duty would not permit him to budge without orders. Perhaps he remembered the Marne and defeat by dislocation. With no place to go, our embarrassment was relieved by the captain's as you were, and we formed again in our familiar column of squads. But in the slight confusion which I have to admit had for a moment prevailed, a uh, metathesis had taken place. From being third squad, we had become fourth, which position carried with it the responsibility of leading the second platoon. When, therefore, the horse order platoon's column left rang out, the company plodded placidly on in column of squads. We seemed to have lost our platoon consciousness. Our captain was annoyed. He knew that we had two platoons, but they declined to separate. Again the order came, without effect. The company now vaguely felt that something was wrong, and suppressed cries of, Hey, Corporal, you're pivot man. Hey, second platoon, wake up came to us from front and rear. With a start, our guilty squad awoke to its new responsibilities and a sense of the eternal watchfulness of the soldier's life. Qui vive? Qui va? The day before Marshal Joffre arrived, I asked our guide, a Plattsburgh veteran, whether the faculty company was to participate in his review of the battalion. His face darkened with apprehension. Say, said he, that would be a mess. He's reviewed better troops than we are. Never more desperate ones, though, we agreed. Like all great soldiers, our officers are modest, even about their handiwork. We of the ranks, however, in our eagerness, feel some disappointment that we cannot exhibit our newly won proficiency, even to General Barry. Oh, I keep it all for Hindenburg. Battalion drill is a great day in the life of the military neophyte and our favorite evolution is the company front double quick. It would have been a pleasure to perform this for the Marshal of France, but our last execution of the maneuver made our officers reluctant to exhibit our proficiency in it again to the jealous eye of authority. In company front, we spread in two ranks well across the field, and at the command double time, we inaugurated a really imposing movement before the reviewing officer. For some reason, the front rank of the first squad set a rapid pace, which the whole rank nobly strove to imitate. The second rank, in fear of being distanced, came thundering up behind, and the first rank, hearing their onset close upon their heels, regularly ran away. In consequence, our alignment, usually so precise, suffered considerably, and it began to look like an interscholastic quarter-mile badly bunched at the finish. Reduced to the more professorial quick time, at the end of the race we soon recovered our breath, if not our composure, and it was remarked that in the rush it had been the faculty orators who led the field, both things being, after all, at bottom, a matter of wind. Before we were dismissed that morning, the reviewing officer commented favorably on our drill, accepting only the double-quick, and admonished us to try to keep from laughing. Yet is it not well known from the writings of Captain Bythe and others that the British Tommies go into action laughing, joking, and singing music-hall ballads? The other day the Major's usual stirring lecture on the art of war was replaced by that threadbare faculty device, a written quiz. The first question, I believe I am disclosing no military secret in telling, was, name the textbook. The answer was, of course, I.D.R., but some poor fellows who had plunged into the contents without first mastering the cover were found wanting. The sociability characteristic of convocation processions naturally tends to pervade our military marching as well. At battalion the other day, we were trying to catch the captain's far-off orders and then to distinguish which of several whistles was the command of execution for our company. When a late arrival dropped into the vacant file beside me, and in the most sociable manner began to relate an experience on the rifle range the Saturday before. This extended narrative was much interrupted, for I lost him every little while, 
under the stress of those far-off orders of which he appeared quite unconscious his method seemed to be to wait for the evolution to be completed and then rejoin me wherever i might be and resume his parable although he did occasionally complain that he had not heard the order nevertheless we learned quickly the other day the first sergeant a theologian of a wholly unsuspected bellicosity called upon the squad leaders to report the first corporal at once glibly cried out all present or accounted for whereupon each successive corporal confident that none of his men had been killed or captured since the day before joyfully answered with the same crisp and comprehensive formula for all our attempts at militarism a certain democratic informality still lingers among us the captain is ordinarily affectionately addressed as henry thus while at rest a voice is heard from the rear rank well henry i don't understand what the rear rank is to do on the order company platoons right now the front rank there's no such command answers the captain patiently thus closing the incident the captain frequently marches backwards so that he can face us and enjoy the swift precision with which we carry out his orders the other day he backed into the east bleacher and sat down abruptly on the bottom step luckily he gave the command to halt or in our blind obedience we should probably have marched right over him up the bleacher and off the back of it into space i shall never forget our first review it was with no little reluctance that our captain consented to our participation in it he seemed to fear that we might shy at the visiting officer's decorations and run away only the most protracted good behavior on our part carried the day after marching past the reviewing party in as straight a company front as we could exhibit we opened our ranks for inspection and the visiting colonel prowled about among us just before he reached our company a student major in a frenzy of apprehension came up and gave us one final adjuration not to wiggle the colonel a fine military figure marched swiftly up and down our ranks stopping now and then to address a few crisp questions to one or another of the men he seemed to select those whose soldierly bearing suggested military promise or at least our corporal and i thought so as we were the men he spoke to in our part of the line or it may be that we were standing so like statues that he wanted to satisfy himself that those marble lips could speak our comrades were of course eager to know what he had said and we had later to tell them that he had imparted to us important military information of a confidential character to which they cynically replied yes he did we also tactfully let it be known that the colonel was anxious to learn whether our officers were perfectly satisfactory with more tractable and appreciative inquirers we entered into more detail he had asked the corporal whether he had ever shot a rifle corporal blushingly admitted that he had once shot a squirrel corporal is a football hero and accustomed to meet the enemy at much closer quarters than rifle range the rest of us on the other hand are publicists and are deadliest at distances of from five hundred to five thousand miles number two was asked if he could cook and claimed that he could colonel in his haste did not think to ask number two if anyone could eat what he cooked or he would have learned that number two's cookery is best suited to prisoners of war colonel had no sooner departed on his inquisitorial way than the student major reappeared from nowhere in a fearful rage to inquire if we couldn't stand still even for two minutes and to complain bitterly that during the inspection one man had been guilty of rubbing his nose murmurs of disapproval ran through the ranks at the mention of this wretched offender who was probably responsible for dragging our company down to a tie with the law school for third place out of nine in the honors of the day captain now mercifully ordered rest and a prodigious and concerted sigh rose from the ranks each man abandoned his poker-like pose of tension for an attitude of infinite dejection and fatigue it was six fifteen and i remarked to number two that my back ached he said his ached clear through our former corporal asked the captain what a man was to do if he had a dinner engagement the captain said he had one but guessed we'd all have to wait for orders to dismiss 
corporal replied that he hadn't one, but just wanted to know. If one is to rise in the service, one should never lose an opportunity of extracting military information from one's officers. We have not yet been promoted to uniforms, but last night after drill we were informed that, while we could not be provided with the invisible olive gray now in fashion, some antiquated khaki-colored uniforms of 1910 were being provided for our adornment. This arrangement met with no objection. The fact is, we are not wholly unaccustomed to wearing clothes of the fashion of 1910, and furthermore, while we have no desire to be conspicuous, some of us rather shrink from the idea of wearing invisible clothing, no matter how fashionable. So full of adventure is military life, even in its most elementary form. But after all, I am not primarily a soldier. I am a human coral insect, that is to say, a university professor, before whom life stretches, as Stevenson said of another class, long and straight and dusty to the grave. I should like to be a volcanic being, shouldering up whole islands at a heave, or even, if that could not be, perhaps engulfing one or two, reluctantly, of course, now and then. Whereas it is my lot in life to labor long and obscurely beneath the surface, to make the intellectual or historical structure of the universe soldier by some infinitesimal increment, about which, in itself, nobody except my wife and me particularly cares. Sometimes, however, I repine a little and wish that I were, say, a porpoise, splashing gaily along at the surface and making a noise in the world. Once in a while, when I'm going to sleep, for even a coral insect must sometimes sleep, dreams float through my mind of sudden achievement, such as might make one a porpoise or better. And once one of these nearly came true, judge how nearly. I was wandering through a half-subterranean Spanish chapel, fitly set with huge old missiles, dark altar pieces, covered stalls, and quaint curios. Its dim recesses beckoned us on from one rich relic to another. Interest quickened. It seemed a place where anything might be awaiting only the expert eye of discovery. I had often fancied such a place, and finding in some dim corner of it a certain long-lost work of literature still remembered after a thousand years' absence. Somewhere in such a sleepy treasure house it doubtless lay, enfolding within its mouldering folios not its quaint contents only, but fame and fortune for its finder. And look, yonder, under a corner staircase, is a shelf of old books, large and small. You approach it with feigned indifference. Here, if anywhere, will be your prize, a manuscript whose unique rarity will awaken two hemispheres. It is not among the ponderous tomes, of course, so you take them down first, postponing putting fortune to the decisive touch. But these small octavos have just the look of promise. They are thin, too, as it would be. And what period more likely for it than that sixteenth century to which they so obviously belong? Only the other day a friend of mine who lives on our reef, and on a branch even more recondite than mine, found among the uncatalogued antiques of an American museum the one long-lost Tel El Amarna tablet, which had disappeared almost as soon as it was discovered, and of which it was only known that it was probably in America. Thus may one be changed in a moment from polyp to porpoise, and be translated from the misty obscurity of the bottom to the stirring, dazzling, delightful surface of things. But after all, the plain truth is that adventure consists less in the experiences one actually has than in the indefatigable expectancy with which one awaits them. Indeed, I sometimes fear that people must be divided into those who have adventures and those who appreciate them. And between the two, the affinity for adventure is greater treasure than the experiencing of it. If we are possessed of the affinity, adventure itself is at most just round the corner from us. This opens the life of adventure to all who crave it. What possibilities lie in merely crossing a street, for example? Someone remarked the other day as he dodged across among the motor cars, why not take a chance now and then and lead a real life for a few minutes? I therefore recommend the life of adventure. It conceives each day as a fresh enterprise, full of delightful possibilities and promise, and so preserves the wine of life from growing flat. 
Here is the secret of youth. The moral of Mr. Disraeli's epigram is, be adventurous. End of the Life of Adventure Recording by Wayne Anderson, Chelsea, Quebec